So because most of you don't know me, as Bob said, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to introduce myself a little, a little more and give some context to what I'm going to say and the reason that I'm going to frame things in the, in the way that I will in the, on the subject of allowing versus control. So I actually live in a nunnery for the most part in northern India. And uh, for the last three years, that's where I've spent most of my time. And my time there is mostly spent in silence and in deep internal reflection. And where I live there is very remote. It's located in the rice fields. It's accessible only on foot. And it's at the foothills of the Himalayan mountains. And I have needed that really sort of extreme isolation and time and the support of the nuns there to come to terms with a new life that I have on this spiritual path because it's remarkably different than the life I was living for quite some time. Um, I didn't grow up being religious at all. I've never read the Bible. I've never been a seeker of any kind. I wasn't interested in any kind of spiritual endeavors or pursuits. I have always just wanted to be kind and compassionate and do good and interesting things in the world to help other people. And I grew up to do that as an executive in Washington, D.C., first in clinical research in respiratory medicine and AIDS, and then as a program director working with um, orphans and caregivers in various countries in Africa. And uh, all was going really well in that life. I really enjoyed what I was doing. I was very successful, and I had a lot of opportunities to help people. And while that was happening, in the summer of 2000, I began to hear a voice. And that voice said that I was supposed to be doing something very important. And over the next few months, that voice just continued to get more persistent and more pronounced. And after six months of that, there was a series of events that sort of led to my first big awakening event. And then the gates just flung open to my metaphysical abilities. And when that happened, it was incredibly confusing to me because I had no context for anything that I was learning since I had no religious background. And so for the next 11 years, I continue to have visions and insights while also continuing to do my very big work in Washington and Africa. And trying to hold these two worlds in balance created even more confusion for me, especially since I had absolutely no idea how to talk about the things that were happening or more specifically what to do with the things that were happening. And that confusion came to a head and the balance of my life really tipped upside down when starting in around 2009, um, all of the normalcy and successes of my personal and professional life just came crashing down in very certain serious terms. So when that happened, when all of my normalcy was gone and the spiritual stuff was sort of glaring at me that I didn't know what to do with, I made the decision that what was happening was that it, this must be a sign that uh, it is time for me now to leave this sort of earthly world and do my work from the spiritual realms. Now, that wasn't anything at all that I was shown. It was simply a decision that I made in my massive confusion and despair. So on March 23, 2011, I took a very carefully timed and um, arranged combination of 97 prescription pain and sleeping pills with three glasses of wine, and then I lay down and said my prayers and thought that that was, that was the end of it. And then two days later, I just woke up. I woke up all by myself, all alone, and uh, I woke up extremely sick and in excruciating pain and with no ability to control my motor skills, but I was alive. And so it was that miracle that sort of forced me into a supreme state of surrender. It was really clear to me that there was some force much greater than I that was in charge of what was going on. So I stopped completely. I stopped completely trying to figure out what was happening. I stopped trying to plan. I stopped trying to fix. I just went into a very extreme state of allowing. And when that happened, suddenly all of these miracles just started happening one after the other in, in, in quick succession. And these doors started flying open very, very easily. And so I, as I would go through 
each door, it took me further and further into this spiritual life that is nothing like I could have ever imagined or would have ever imagined sort of in my own mental abilities at that time. And so going through those doors was how I eventually landed in a nunnery in, 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 in India. And I actually ended up in that nunnery just barely six months after my suicide attempts. A suicide attempt. So that tells you how quickly those miracles sort of unfolded for me there. So the details of that journey are the basis of the book that Bob mentioned, Unwitting Mystic. And um, I came out of my isolation, um, my sweet little paradise, in July and came to the United States on my uh, book tour. And that's how I met Bob and Newell. It was actually on my last stop on that book tour. Um, in November. So it was a wonderful way to end my um, debut book tour here in America on that fortuitous note with Bob and Noel and Carrie. So that's how I got to where I am today. And to give you an idea of the things that I know and how I know. So most of my insights are, um, they, they relate to the absolute foundations of divine truth and the core beliefs that shape much of our world. And to give you an example, my very first medical, uh, metaphysical event was that I went into the body of Jesus at his moment of crucifixion. And I spent three and a half hours in that event understanding everything that had happened in the evolution of mankind over untold millennia leading up to that point. And I understood exactly what was happening in the world in that moment, not just the crucifixion moment, but everything that was happening. And then I could watch as everything unfolded from that point forward to current day. So it was like understanding the world and Christianity before Christianity with the the birth of Christianity and then the evolution of Christianity from the perspective of Christ. And in that same vein, a few years later, one of my experiences was going into the mind of Buddha at his first moment of enlightenment. And so I was seeing exactly what he saw and understanding things in the same way that he was understanding them before any words were ascribed to that experience or any teachings came out of it. So it was the moment of the foundation of Buddhism from the vantage point of Buddha. And other events have been exactly the same kinds of um, origins, if you will, of something. The origins of conscious awareness, the origins of the universe as we know it, the first moment that as a speck of energy being infused with the God source and waking up to consciousness, and actually being in and as that God source in the, the, the vast, beautiful, exquisite void of pure nothingness and pure potential. So that's what I mean about it being the absolute foundations of divine truth. And at the same time, my experiences have also been in and as the energies of fear and judgment and difficulties to forgive and these other things that are sort of the underpinning and the interweaving of the difficulties that we experience in our sort of normal human life. So um, my insights are both universal in nature, but they're also applicable to and part of the individual everyday human experience. But my sight is also quantum in that I can see and embody energetic movements. So I understand the infinite number of patterns and properties of energy that make up what we perceive of reality and how we're perceiving that reality. <clears throat> so I can see these things both on a subtle level, like right in front of me, and on a more cosmic level, like planetarily what's happening. And I can watch those changes um, in real time. So most of this I do not do on command. I have very little control over how and when things happen. And because of that, that means that I live in a constant state of allowance. I have to stay in sort of a chronic open state for these things to come to me in the way that they're meant to in the time that they're meant to. So, and they also come in a very pure way, 
because I have no filters, because I have no religious background, everything comes to me in a very sort of clean and clear way. So that's the basis of what I know, and it's going to frame how I see the issue of allowance and control in conscious creation. So in talking about that subject, I'm going to focus on five key points for this talk. Now, this is kind of a sophisticated group, I know. And so what I'm going to say is probably going to seem quite basic to you, but there's actually a lot of really core level depth to these things. And for that reason, I'm going to ask that you really try to stay centered in your heart as you listen to me and actually don't think intellectually at all about what I'm going to say. Don't, don't listen with your mind at all. Just let this soak in directly from the heart if you can. And then at the end, I'm going to give you um, just a little short list of the qualities to look for that will signal, signal when you're in a true state of allowing. And I'm just going to take a quick sip of water here. <clears throat> okay. So first, I'm going to start off really, really basic. I'm just going to talk about the, the, the basic difference between controlling and allowing in a very basic way. So the definition of control is the power to influence behavior or outcomes. And the definition of allow is to give the necessary time or opportunity for something to happen. So just by those definitions, um, you can suspect that the energies related to control will be restrictive because by definition, there's a force trying to override natural flow. And at the same time, you can tell that the energies related to allowing are going to be more expansive because there's no resistance to natural flow. So control uses energy but it actually cuts down on the collective energy potential and in fact stresses it because of resistance. Whereas allowing makes the most use of collective energy's natural magnitude and power. So what that energy of control actually looks like in our real life basis as we think about consciously creating, it looks a little like we're constantly pushing on a door that says pull. We're actually using more energy to put pressure where it's not needed to force what we want to come into fruition, and we're not getting the benefit or the magnitude of things flowing to us easily. So control inherently implies that we have an expectation of the specifics of an outcome. There's going to be outcomes no matter what, but control means that we want that outcome to be in a certain way. And this not only applies to outcomes for ourselves, but also for others and the world around us. And when we try to control outcomes for or through others, that means that we're taking away their choices, which creates in in itself, that activity in itself creates an energy of resistance, especially in our newly awakened world, where the energies are more and more flowing in the direction of our divine sovereignty. So when we do that, we're literally going against the flow of the very thing that we really want. So when we do try to control and our desired outcomes don't happen in our desired time frames, which we're also trying to control, we get disappointed. And then we start kicking up these old narratives in our minds, even though we know we're not supposed to. We we sort of secretly start cursing the law of attraction or we get really frustrated with these unconscious people that are around us making these unconscious decisions. Um, Maybe we even start questioning our spiritual path or we start questioning our self-worth because here we are again, we failed to manifest the thing that we wanted in the way that we wanted it. So when we do that, we we usually tell ourselves that we're fine, that it's okay, or we say to other people, oh, it's fine, you know, it should happen, this is just the way it goes. But the truth that we're vibrating with is one of doubt and disappointment. So from the sort of old-fashioned divine perspective, these are the moments that we've clashed wills with God. So in my book, I talk about an insight that I had in which I was swept up into the arms of Jesus and integrated into his body, and then the two of us were absorbed into the greater Christ consciousness. And in that insight, I'm speaking as Jesus about why humanity has not been able to find peace before now 
And I say that this battle, meaning man's battle, has always been about man's will versus God's gifts. So I won't go into detail here, but the crux of that lesson was that we, and when I say we, I mean mankind, we have consistently desired to identify more with what we humans can control than we have desired to identify more with the will of an entity that we really don't know. Which leads me to the next point, um, which is the thing that's at the root of our inability to truly let go and just allow. And it's framed around the question, do we really trust what we're talking about these days in terms of oneness and knowing that source or God is truly a part of us and has our best interest at heart? Do we really trust that? Now, there's a lot of attention that's paid lately to this issue of letting go and just allowing things to unfold and just letting it all be. But in reality, there's actually a deep-seated fear that most of us have that if we fully surrender, that means we're at the mercy of an entity that we really don't know. We believe we know or we believe in it, but we really don't know it. Or we um, fear that we're at the mercy of a collective consciousness that at a deep level we really don't trust. And so we have this deep-seated fear that we're really not going to have a real true say in our own future. So not a lot of people talk about that, but it's when we take the time and the willingness to really go in at our deepest level of the truth within, we'll find that that fear is sitting there. And this fear, of course, is a product of our conditioned perception that we're separate from God. In the absence of any real awareness versus a belief in our true connection to God and to our own divinity, we all have such a death grip on this mindset of fear that we as a human race have not, never been able to authentically trust or allow. And we simply can't know ourselves as the pure goodness of God without that supreme trust. We talk a great game about this, and for the last couple of years, it's really been a lot of people talking a lot of good game. But the truth is that most of us stop just short of that full allowing. So I want to offer the idea that genuine allowance is an act of embracing our deepest fears. It's the way that we can invite them in with the whole of who we are so that then we can look at those fears compassionately and begin to transmute them to love. Because So when we try to control something, fear is the tool that we're actually using. It's the thing we actually have in our grip. So we can't transmute it because it's the thing that we're using at that time. But by allowing we can actually give our fears room to come into this safe space of acceptance. And we can actively give them respect and gratitude because in truth, our fears have worked very hard to teach us an enormous amount about life and love. So if you find that you just had any resistance to what I just said about embracing your fears, you'll want to check that. Because if you do, it means that you're judging your fears as bad or scary or you're trying to override them or um, avoid them in some way. And in my experience, judging, denying, and avoiding our fears is the number one cause of our inability to let go and authentically open ourselves up to genuine allowing. Which then leads me to the next thing I want to talk about, and that is the impact of our actions or inactions on the collective. So in the big picture, when we're willing to fully address our own judgment and fears, we can have a massive impact on the ability of the collective to allow. And I'll give you an example of what that looks like. And Carrie, you've heard this before, so just bear with me. So let's say that Bob and I have a conflict of some, some kind. I've done something terrible to Bob, or he thinks that I have, or I feel like I have. And so Bob and I have a, an energy of conflict between us. 
And what that looks like from an energy perspective when that happens is it looks a little like a thread. You can imagine just a thread that's been wound around us very tightly. And as we talk about um, what's happened as we get into the energies of blame and victimhood and anger and all of these things that we feel in conflict, we uh, wrap that um, thread tighter and tighter and we just tangle it up more and more and more. As we think about it and as we talk about it, that's what we do. And then Bob and I are pushing and pulling against each other and just getting tangled up even more. And then as I'm talking to other people in my own world about it, I'm doing the same thing with them. I'm extending that thread around those other people as well. And Bob's on his end doing the same thing, especially if those people push the same button that was pushed in the conflict between Bob and I. And so now we find ourselves wrapped up with all of these people, and we're all moving around and pushing and pulling and just getting so entangled in this energy of conflict around this issue. And this is actually what we look like planetarily. We're all wrapped up within and around each other in these energies, energy entanglements of conflict. It's everywhere, and these are the things that have bound us down in a very still state and not able to flow. So when we, this, when we look inside ourselves, if I, in this situation with Bob, if I take the time and I'm really willing to, to honestly and earnestly go within myself and look at my own responsibility for my behavior, my thoughts, my feelings, or whatever, as it pertains to judgment and fear in this conflict. And I get to that place where I can really, truly forgive. And that forgiveness is not going to be a fob because that's a judgment that Bob did something wrong. That forgiveness will always be just for me. When I get to that place of forgiveness for me, then I, that's the only way and the only place from which I can transmute my energies of judgment and fear to love. And what that looks like on an energy level is those fears that are wrapped around me in that thread literally just fall away. All of that energy just opens up because now those energies of fear and judgment are transmuted to something of compassion and caring and love and now they open up and they flow. So my end of the thread drops away. And when my end drops away and opens up, and flows, now Bob's end has to loosen necessarily as well. And so does that thread loosen from all the people that are around me that I've been talking to and Bob's end that he's been talking to. And now the flow and the opening happens on a much greater scale than just me. And so that too is what's happening on a planetary basis right now as more and more and more of us are willing to go inside and be responsible for transmuting our own judgment and fears into energies of love, we're opening up our channels of love for the collective. We're dropping our ends of these threads and we're letting the energies flow for the collective. So this leads me to the next thing, which is to to tell you that what we're being called towards right now in our desire to consciously create, what we're being called for in that, um, that desire is actually what's best for the collective. And so when we allow for ourselves, it inherently means that the desires of the co- um, greater collective can flow as well. So in the, um, in the issues of control, when we try to imagine and create through control, Obviously, we don't mean to do that, but when we do that, where we do it mostly is in our personal lives. Even if we're thinking about, you know, on a greater scale, we want a world of harmony and we want people to be more conscious of better environmental policies or whatever, the changes that we um, try to control mostly towards that happen in our own lives. And they start with the the basic things of, I want this house, I want this job, I want this kind of abundance, I want this kind of partner or this kind of thing to happen. And so we look at the successes or failures on a more individual basis like that, on on an ongoing daily basis. And when we're disappointed 
because those things aren't happening, what we aren't realizing is that what comes into fruition in our lives, if it affects other people, it has to be the right thing and time for those other people as well. So we are inherently impacted by the collective energies of the world that we're living in or the people that we're around. So our individual abilities to manifest are influenced by the collective energies. This has always been the case. But the difference now is that what we individually are desiring is actually what the collective is desiring as well. So when we truly allow in our own individual lives, we get the best of all things. We get the most magnificent things for us and the most magnificent things for our world. So while we need to keep our patience in check, we also need to realize that we're in a larger game that's shifting now, and what's on the horizon is that collective collaborating, right, collaborative creating, will in fact speed things along for us individually, and vice versa. So the more we allow, the more collective, the collective allows, and vice versa. So um, the last point I want to make, excuse me, I'm going to have some more water here. The last thing I want to talk about is um, the topic of imagining. So there's also a lot of talk about envisioning a new world, especially as it relates to conscious creation. And we talk a lot about imagining what we want and what it will look like, but our experience of imagination so far has been primarily imagining improved versions of things we've already experienced in our past. We're looking for bigger and better versions of things that have already come along. And in that, there's actually a bit of holding us back, even though that's clearly not our intention. Because we've never been at this level of awakening in our evolution before. So we don't even know how or what to imagine. So we have to come up with ways to go beyond the limits of mental imagination when we think about conscious creation. And the way that we do that is from the heart, which there's also a lot of talk about, and um, it's right on target, this um, creating from the heart. I have a chapter in my book where I talk about um, an insight and going into what the world and what creating looks like from the heart versus what it looks like from the mind. And one of the things that, it, it looks very different, and one of the ways that it looks different from a creating standpoint is that what we imagine in our, in our idea of creation is completely open-ended. It doesn't have any specifics of the way that it has to look, because if we go back to the beginning, the, if we look at specifics of an outcome, that's control. But open-ended means it's, we're just directing things in, <clears throat> excuse me, we're just creating things in a general direction that the universe can sort of show us the magnificence of where that might take us. We don't know where it might take us. But our creating from the heart allows it to be open-ended and <clears throat> whatever is the, the magnificence that can happen from that can happen. And then the second thing is when we create from the heart, and this is, this is kind of a difficult one, but instead of narrating what we're imagining with words, and we do that even if we're just using an image, like a, a, a picture of a table or something, we actually assign a word to it as we're, in, as we're imagining that. That's just a natural thing that we do. But in creating from the heart, we don't narrate as we go with words we narrate with how we feel. So we narrate what we want without using words and without any kind of intellectual filter or analysis or judgment that it's good or bad or right or wrong or any of that kind of stuff. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, let's say that I'm going to make this really, really simple. Let's just say that we're imagining getting up tomorrow morning. And so in our mental imagination, the way that we would normally do that is we would just sort of see ourselves getting out of bed and putting on our slippers and see ourselves sort of sleepily walking through the living room and into the kitchen and we get some coffee and we sit down and we've, we've, 
seen that and we've narrated the whole thing. But that's actually a very superficial kind of imagining. If we do that from the heart and we let the heart feel our way through that same exact scene, what we feel is we feel the body waking up. We feel that heaviness. We feel that grogginess. We feel that clumsiness of trying to put on our slippers and we feel the temperature of the air in the house as we're walking and realizing very slowly our thoughts are sort of rising to the surface. We smell the coffee and we feel the warmth of the coffee cup. There's a whole experience of the event rather than a seeing of the event. And what's happening when we do that through the heart when we're doing it in the way that we feel, is that we're in touch with the nuances of the experience. And when we're in touch and creating, <clears throat> excuse me, from the nuance of the experience, we're actually using the energies that are created in real time in those, in those events. So we're using the same exact in, um, building blocks of energy when we create a nuance through the heart and feeling that would actually happen when those things occur. So it's a great, huge difference between the mental imagination and the living experience of feeling into the nuance of what we're trying to create, if that makes sense. So I have a very um, simple but kind of difficult exercise, simple to do but difficult to practice exercise it helps me to do that. And that is, when I think about things that I want to create or, or things that I want to manifest in some way, I um, sit up straight and, or stand up straight and I really open my, my chest area, in particular around my heart chakra and my solar plexus. And I imagine, I close my eyes and then I go into my heart space and I try to literally project out into the field in front of me what I want um, without using any words. I project the feeling of what it is that's happening as it's going on without any words. And when you, when you try to practice that, you'll realize it's extremely difficult. And it takes, a, uh, it takes quite a bit of focus. It's a little bit like a meditation, um, but it's a really good meditations and it's it's very powerful to do once you can kind of get the hang of it so that's just a suggestion for that so um, those are the five points that I wanted to talk about and then I just want to share a few qualities of what it actually feels like to be in a pure state of allowing versus kind of an egoic level of, of control without realizing it so um, just what I just said, um, when we're in a, a state of allowing, you feel it more than you think it. That's the key thing that you'll notice, is that this is more of a feeling into what we're trying to create rather than a thinking about it. And then the next thing is, when we're in that really heart space creation mode uh, of allowing, it feels more fun, but kind of in a spiritual way rather than a, in an egoic way. And when you, I'm sure that there's a better way to probably say that, but I don't know it. Um, it just has a greater sense of deep fun, a really sincere enjoyment about it. That's a very sincere happiness in creating that kind of thing rather than an egoic kind of um, false joy. And the next thing is, is that creation in that allowing mode from the heart feels deeply honest. It is like... Um, it's sort of like we've just exhaled that last bit of resistance to go into that really deep, honest place, <clears throat> and we let ourselves really just start from there, from whatever the foundation of that really honest thing is that we really, truly want. It feels much more honest than an egoic kind of plan. <clears throat> the next thing is, is that even... In the, either in the creation mode, the, the, the creation thinking about it, or in the unfolding of it, even if there are challenges, it still feels easier. And by that I mean there are challenges that can feel frustrating and there are challenges that feel invigorating. And you'll know that you're in the 
good state of allowing when the challenges that you're facing feel invigorating. <clears throat> and then the next thing is it feels really expansive. And when you can stay really centered in that heart space in conscious creating, it feels a little like being able to reach back into the universe and access the realm of potential for everything. It feels that expansive. So that's a clear sign that you're in the right place. And then the next thing is it will have a, um, you, you have a sense of that there's a kernel of intuitive knowing versus a, a kind of desperate wishing. There's a real difference, and you can actually feel that in different places in your body. The desperate wishing is literally going to be, you'll feel it around your head. I feel it always kind of right in front of my face, like a, project, a mental projection that's coming directly out of my head. But the intuitive knowing is exactly what people talk about in terms of a gut knowing. They just feel it in their gut, and that's where it is. It will be right around your third chakra. You just know that this is right. And then the next one is, is very cool. In either the, the um, conscious creation um, time of it, in sort of imagining, or in the unfolding of it, it will feel more like a reward than a victory. By that I mean, you know, when you're given something as a reward that is just feels really um, like big. It feels really like, wow, I didn't see, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, you feel that you, you really accomplish something by allowing. You can feel that it's a consciousness by allowing. And versus um, a, a victory is something you went and obtained. You went and got it. And that's more of an egoic kind of thing. So, and then the last thing is that um, conscious creation from a heart-centered space of allowing has an, a wondrous, unexpected quality to it. It is really a, boy, I just didn't see that. That's amazing. I couldn't have imagined that. There's that quality. I couldn't have imagined that in the way that it unfolded or the way that it came up if you were sort of struck with an idea suddenly that you don't know where that came from. That's where your heart-centered allowing is. So those are the qualities that I, I note for my own self and the things that I've seen um, in my insights. And for my own life, I um, have a, a tool that I use um, to keep me kind of centered in the state of allowing, and that is part three of my book. I use it for a lot of things, but in particular I use it to stay centered in a heart space for allowing what I want. And part three of my book is very short, and it's words that were given to me directly from Jesus about what it is to live in Christ consciousness or as Christ consciousness. So for me, this is what the balance of allowing and inspired creating looks like when I harness my own ability to fully surrender in everyday living and open my heart to divine inspiration. So my imagining is done in union with the Christ consciousness, and in doing that, it actually brings me more deeply into living as Christ consciousness. And so to give you um, an idea of what that is, I'll read you just page one from part three of my book. It's very short, but this is sort of the meditation of allowing that I look at each day. So I'll just read this now. I am the way of love, the truth of love, and the luminous light of love. Where the rhythm of awareness beats in the heart, I am Christ. Where trust prevails and fear is no more, I am Christ. I am pure compassion, kindness, and wisdom. I am absolute peace and love. I am all possibility. I am all. I am. So that's the last bit that I have to say, and I'll just wrap up with um, this. I want to encourage everyone, as much as you can, to love absolutely everything that is unfolding, because every single bit of it is leading us into a magnificent world, far greater than any of us 
can truly imagine. So just be in love with every bit of it from your heart and soul.